That's good. That's fun. Well, we're going to go somewhere a little different this morning. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, would you take your Bibles and would you turn to the book of Job? The book of Job. And we're going to look at chapter one of Job. And uh, I believe that this is a story that that gets um, a bad rap. And so I want to I want to point out some things and bring out some things this morning that hopefully will um, be enlightenment to us. And how many of you deal? Well, I, I don't want to raise of hands, but if you ever in your lifetime deal with any kind of fear, this is actually a wonderful book to be involved in. And, and I'll show you why here in a minute. But would you uh, would you look at verse one with me of Job chapter one? Let's read it here. I'm going to read to you out of the New King James. It says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters. He had seven sons and three daughters who were born to him. Also, I I forgot to mention this and I need to before I go much farther. Um, You... You guys do such a great job in honoring God in so many ways. I'm going to ask you to honor God in one more way. And that's that we limit moving around during during the preaching of the word. If you could help me there, that would be a blessing. So he had seven sons. He had three daughters that were born to him. And also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 male donkeys and very large household Uh, So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So here he's the Sam Walton of the East. And his sons would go and they would feast in their houses, each one on his appointed day. Appointed day is birthday. Okay, so they're having a celebration. And they would send and invite their three sisters and they would eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of fasting had, had run its course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings and uh, according to the number of them all. For Job said this, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. He did this regularly. He did it in, in a consistent way. So, so his sons are having these birthdays and they're having gatherings for their birthdays. So how many of you feel like that's common? You know, I mean, a birthday celebration, hey, it's a time of celebrating you're a year older. Nicole said that people who have birthdays live longer. So that's a good thing. I mean, that means you're, you're continuing to grow, continuing to live, Right? But now here comes Job after the birthday party celebration is over. Wait a minute. We might have offended God in some way. I want to sanctify you guys. I want to pull together offerings and sacrifices. And we're going to sacrifice to God in case you may have offended him. Another scripture says that anything that is not of faith is sin. Anything that is not of faith is sin. So I want to submit to you this morning that fear is sin. Fear actually works in reverse to faith. What does faith do? We believe God. We believed God this morning. We took communion together. When we received that, I believe God that I am healed. It's a, it's a faith that draws healing towards you because you believe God's word. That's the mark of a Christian is you're a believer. Some one person told me, they said, well, I believe in God. I thought, congratulations, you're at a demon level. They believe in God. That does not determine faith. It's that you believed what he said and that you walk in that. But fear, all all the enemy knows how to do, Satan, he, he can't create. He is a created being right when he fell his name was lucifer he was one of the archangel angels he was the most beautiful angel out of all of them the most had more power than any of them and when he fell when he was cast down to the earth 
he doesn't have the same ability that God does. He, he can't create. And that's one reason that he's jealous of you, because you can create. You're made in the image of God. How do I create, Phil? With your words and with your faith. You can literally create. So why do you think the enemy spends the bulk of his time trying to sow thoughts into you to try and get you to say things that work to his benefit? I, I don't know that I can. I'm just, I'm, not, I'm just, I am up here totally winging by the Spirit of God this morning. Graphics lady's going, where? You're not doing any of your notes. No, I am not. And it's okay. But so, so... So here's the deal. So he can't create. So he has to try and manipulate you to create for him by speaking. Because we have the ability to speak things into existence. Think about it. What do athletes do to encourage themselves? Oh, they say all kinds of things over themselves. They call it psychology, but really it's a biblical principle. You know, that we can have what we say. God has given us that ability. I remember my daughter in the fifth grade, when she came into the fifth grade, she had great difficulty in school. She said, suddenly the work, dad, is much harder than it was in fourth grade. I can't just slide by. Now they're actually making the work harder. And I remember laying her to, down to sleep. And some of you have heard this story, but I said, I said, girl, you understand every concept. You are so good at school. School is easy. To you. It comes simply. You're able to solve every problem. And what am I doing? I'm speaking over her what I want to see. But what if I said, what if I said, well, you know, your Uncle Joe, I don't have an Uncle Joe, by the way, but your Uncle Joe, you know, he wasn't very good at school either. Now, how does that encourage her? How does that lift her up? How does that build her faith? It doesn't, thank you. <laughs> it doesn't build anything, right? And so we have that ability. And so all the devil knows how to do, though, is to pervert what God has created because God is the ultimate creative being. So God created faith. And so the enemy, all he knows to do is, I've, now I've got to pervert faith. So I'm just going to make a knockoff. And it's fear. Fear is the knockoff, but it works in the same way. Now, you guys know the story of Job. Flip over a page. And I want you to look at chapter 2, because now what's happened is Job has had terrible things happen in his life. The enemy has come. He has, he has come before God. Now, there's many different conversations about, did he ask for Job? Did he not ask for Job? Here's what I want to submit to you, basically, and, and I want to base it on the principle of fear is because the fear that Job had that we may have offended God opened a door. It gave the enemy an inlet. That's what I submit to you. And I base that on this scripture in Job chapter 2. Look at verse 25. This is Job saying this. He said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Chapter 3. Sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, there it is. Chapter 3. <laughs> verse 25. He said, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. Okay, you don't have dread unless you think about it often. And we see that he thinks about it often because it's in the practice of a birthday party celebration. Oh, we might have offended God. We don't want to offend God. And what did we say? Anything that's not of faith is sin. So, so this is why I'm bringing this up. When, uh, man, when we purchased our first house and we moved in, Zach was just a little baby. Becco, my daughter, was, you know, like 16 months, 18, 20 months, something like that. And Zach was three months. Yeah, and she was 21. Okay, thanks, honey. And so when we moved in to the house, it was a little three-bedroom house. It was in my parents' neighborhood just down the street from them. And we got all moved in. And... You know, and so now I'm living in a house for the first time. Every, uh, everything up to that point, we'd lived in an apartment. Now I'm starting to feel the overwhelming responsibility of being the dad, the man of the house. And I didn't own a gun. I didn't even have a baseball bat, you know. I mean, I'm just, 
in my, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I feel this responsibility. Well, I let that, I let the thought of that, the fear of that begin to creep in little by little. And so what happened was at nighttime, I would lock all the doors and it used to bug me because I didn't understand what it was like. Nicole had a daycare and so she would drive our suburban and take all the kids to the mall. You had how many kids? Eight kids? Seven. Seven kids. That's a lot of fun. That's a party waiting to happen right there. And she would take them to the mall, bring them back, and then I would find the suburban unlocked. I'd be like, honey, you've got to lock the truck because... We, our garage was a converted room uh, that turned into my music studio, actually. And then, and then, so we had a carport, and we would park out underneath the carport. Well, she would back in, and it's unlocked, ready to go for whoever, you know. And so I would get on her about it, you know. And then at nighttime, I started waking up all through the night, and, and I had this urge. It was fear. This anxiety, this worry. I mean, we can give it all these cute little pet names, but the bottom line is it's fear. Did I, I want, I would go and check the doors, make sure maybe I forgot to lock the door. You know, if a bulb was burnt out, I made sure that that light bulb was lit so we could see out there. So see what I'm doing? What am I doing? I'm, I am succumbing to the fearful thoughts that I'm having. This went on for a while. And I let it, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm, I'm telling you because I feel like it would help someone. Is I, you know, I began to let that dominate, rule my life. And, and I remember one evening, I was getting ready for bed. I was way back in the bedroom and the, the kitchen was right by the front door and then the driveway. And Nicole called back to the bedroom. She said, honey? I said, yeah. She said, our truck just started, our Suburban. So I go running out the front door just in time to watch my Suburban go drive down the street. They were gone. And I just, and I knew immediately that the fear that I allowed in my heart drew this to me. It convicted my heart. Are you tracking me? I could totally identify with this verse. The thing that I feared the most has come upon me. What I dreaded more than anything has happened to me. I have no answer (laughs) for that. Yeah, she probably locked it. She said, no, probably not. But anyway, it's okay. Because it was easy pickings, man. And uh, it's amazing how easy it is to steal one of those old Suburbans. I think it was a 90, 1990 we had. But anyway... And so, so we call the police, file the report, do all that. And Nicole and I walk him back in the house. It's probably somewhere around 10 o'clock now at night. And I, I said, honey, I need to repent. I need to ask you to forgive me. And I asked her, um, I told her that I'd been allowing fear to creep into my heart all of this time. And that I've felt like that was the reason that that opened the door to this happening. And I asked the Lord to forgive me. And I repented right there. And an amazing thing happened. We went back to the bedroom and and fell asleep. I fell asleep. I woke up to my doorbell ringing at midnight. And I come to the door and it's a police officer. And he said, hey, are you Mr. Johnson? And I said, yes. He said, we found your Suburban. Would you like to go and get it? I said, glory to God. I said, how is it? And he said, it looks fine. He says, just probably out of gas. I said, okay. I said, so I'm talking to him on the way there. I said, so what happened? How, how, did, how did you find him? And he said, well, we were driving down Peoria, if you know Tulsa. We were driving down Peoria, and we got behind this Suburban and we remembered that there was a call and we checked the license plate with that one. And so we turned our lights on. He said, normally they run when you do that. He said, but they didn't. He said, these two guys pulled over into the, into the store, into a convenience store. Both of them got out and went like this. And the police officer said, I've never seen that before. He had never seen that before. And he said that... 
they both calmly, you know, just lifted their hands. And when I got there, I saw the two of them in the police car. And they looked at me. I said, God, thank you for taking care of those guys. Bless them. And, and I got in my truck, and sure enough, I was on fumes, but I had enough to get home. And uh, got home, and so we started the truck with a screwdriver for a while, you know, because all you have to do is break the console and just use a screwdriver and pull it back, and fires right up, you know. So we couldn't use the key anymore, so I had to leave my truck unlocked. <laughs> so, you know, so I thought, I, but, but from that point forward, here's my point. From that point forward, when I recognized fear, I treated fear from that point forward as as a poison. I will not allow it in my mind. Because if you allow it in your mind, it sinks down into your heart. And fear will dominate every part of your life. This is why I I have a challenge, personal challenge. I do not investigate sicknesses, especially if it's something I have. I don't educate myself personally. You know why? Because it can be damaging to your faith. You, you'll get to where you know more about the sickness than you know about the promises of God that rid you from the sickness. See, because everyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Jesus became a curse for you and died for that so that you could be freed from it. Man. So look at what God did. There's been multiple times ever since then that, that um, we've slept accidentally with the garage door open. Or, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, we've left our vehicles unlocked. We've, but, but, and I'm, I walk out and go, Oh, well, thank God everything looks like it's still here, you know. I, but, I, but I'm not, I refuse to walk in fear over that. I, I was talking to Gary about, um, you know, my wife and I, we used to have a little um, scooter. I bought, I had a 250cc scooter. So, I mean, it, you know, it would go pretty good. You can get up on the highway. You probably wouldn't want to be on the highway on it. But, I mean, it would go pretty quick. And we used to enjoy riding around. You know, well, for me, I didn't grow up riding motorcycles, so I didn't want to have to shift anything and think about traffic all at the same time. So I just wanted something I could just think about traffic. And so we would ride around, and and I learned where to be, where not to be. I learned how to blink my lights when I'm stopping. You know, you learn all these things, and you slow down when people are riding you, you know, in the back, so they'll go around. So, So, you know, I mean, you don't try to outrun them, you know. And so I, there's just all this stuff. But here's what can happen with a motorcycle. A lot of people don't want to own a motorcycle. Why? They're afraid. They're afraid to be in an accident. They're not afraid of having a motorcycle. They're afraid of dying on one. And if that's your mindset, you better not have a motorcycle. Let me be honest with you. You need to not have a motorcycle because you're afraid. But, and so you, cause you can't ride a motorcycle in fear. You have to, okay. So, you, you know, and so anyway, here's, here's what happened. God brought restitution because of this guy. One, they paid restitution. They told me, they said, oh, you're never going to be able to get any money out of these guys because that's like getting blood out of a turnip. The police officer told me that. Yeah, on the truck, because we had to, you know, it cost $600 to get the console replaced. Well, guess what? The guy paid restitution. God convicted his heart. Look at what God did. But let me tell you, let me tell you about fear. You know, have, you ever, have you ever looked at rat poison? Um, rat poison is interesting. I think I heard it was... 98% or 97% food and 3% arsenic, poison. Because you have to get the rat to eat the food. Okay, so if I had a cake up here that all of you smelt, it's fresh, out of the oven, it's an amazing cake, it's 99% cake. But it's 1% poison. Would you like to have a piece? 
Why wouldn't you want a peace? Why wouldn't you want to have a peace? It's not the 99% cake that's the problem. It's that 1% poison that I have an issue with. We have to treat fear the same way. I would not... mm -mm, I'm not going there. See, the biggest pandemic was not COVID in 2020. The biggest pandemic was the fear of COVID. It was the fear of it. Oh, let me share this. Let me share a couple. Uh, turn over to a familiar scripture over in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. This is a very familiar scripture. You guys probably know the one that I'm going to read, but it's in verse 7. Chapter 1. Thank you, honey. I'm so grateful for a wife that helps keep me on track up here. I really am. Uh, 2 Timothy, look at, look at chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear didn't come from God. If you're having an opportunity with fear, guess who that didn't come from? Didn't come from God. And see, we're supposed to take thoughts captive. What does it mean to take thoughts captive? That means that you choose to believe his promise more than you choose to believe what you're seeing or the what ifs that you're hearing. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if that? Oh my word, man, you could, you could get yourself in a frenzy over what ifs. That was why Nicole and I, when we first got married, that, that we heard often, uh, you just wait. That was the phrase that we heard. You just wait. You just wait. You just wait. You know? I, I mean, <sighs> there was never anything positive that followed that statement, those three words. You just wait. One of these days, you know, you'll get married and then you'll understand. You know, you'll understand what it's like to have to compromise and you give up so much. I mean, I, I was awful. And I was, and then we get, then Nicole and I get married and everything is wonderful. And they say, well, you just wait. You don't have any kids yet. Then we have our first kid and everything's great. The first kid. Well, you only have one. You just wait until you have, and I thought, oh my word, there is no end to you just wait. There is no end to what ifs. What if? What if? What if? Let me tell you something. And on January 8th, 2011, my mom experienced a massive heart attack. At the time, I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was I got a call from my dad. We, I lived three doors down from my, dad, from my parents at the time. We were in Louisville, Kentucky. And I get a phone call from my dad, and he said, Phil, could you come down here? Your mom isn't feeling good, and she doesn't look good either. Well, my dad never called me like that. And so I went down to their house. When I got down there, she's sitting on the couch, and she's having a hard time breathing. Little do I know, her lungs are filling with fluid because she's having congestive heart failure. I don't, I don't know what's... I'm not trained medically. <laughs> you know, I just love God. And so anyway, so she's on the couch, and she's having difficulty breathing. She talked to me, and I, and I remember, I said, Mom, are you having pain in your, in your arms and in your chest? And she said, yes. And I thought, I said, Dad, we need to take her to the hospital. So I just put my hand on her real quick, and I said, I speak health, wholeness, and life into my mom's body now, in Jesus' name. And so we drive to the hospital. We get to the hospital. A miracle happens. The um, cardiologist, the heart uh, surgeon, is there. And he just finished with somebody else. So they get mom up on the elevator, you know, and, and he, he uh, does a procedure. You know how they put the stent in and the, because your, your vessel collapses. And I've got a whole video of it. It's really fun to watch, you know. And then they balloon it back out and they rest, he restored the blood flow. And so now the heart attack is resolved. But we have a challenge. Heart attacks are, are really hard on the body. And so now mom is, she, they, bring her, they bring us into the room. She's in the critical care unit. And here we are in this room. And mom is plugged into every machine that you can be plugged into. And interesting that I'm in the room and there's seven nurses all around her bed. And I'm like... They've seen this before. They've seen this show. <laughs> they, 
you know, and the doctor says to my dad, he says, uh, Mr. Johnson, um, your wife, she's continuing to lose blood pressure. We're doing everything that we can to get her blood pressure to come up. He said, but if she may drop to a certain point where she will flatline, do you want me to resuscitate her? Well, that's real faith building, isn't it? It's encouraging. And I remember looking at him and then a lady leaned over to me and she said, she said, um, Mr. Johnson, would you like a chaplain? So, yeah. What's that do to your faith? Now, here's in, this is interesting. Three years prior, the Lord had really dealt with me about healing. I'd been studying and studying every scripture I could get my hands on regarding healing because I wanted to see God move. I wanted to see uh, his miracle signs and wonders come back. And so, anyway, so we were actually doing a study on seven steps to answered prayer by Kenneth Hagin at the church. And we, and, and I, you know, and so I think it's really interesting that all that was going on. And so when that happened, I remember my, my dad leaned over to my mom, kissed her, said something. I leaned over uh, mom and said, mom, you're fighting a good fight. Keep it up, you know, and we walked back and here we are in the waiting area. Well, the fear in me said, I'm going to pray all night. Because somehow my sacrifice of prayer is going to move God. People, sometimes they, they come to a place where they're like, you know, well, if I, if I beg God, he may move. And I remember I got back in that, I got back in that waiting area and I began to walk back and forth and I began to pray. And uh, my dad encouraged me not to, um, not to do that because I, I'm pretty sure he saw that I wasn't in faith, that I was in fear. And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said, you've already prayed, now stand. And I just went. And so I plopped down on the couch and I went, God, you're going to have to show me how to stand. I don't know. I Show me what that means. And I looked, I looked on the little stand and there was a Gideon Bible that I brought up from the other waiting area because I didn't know if they'd have one upstairs, so I grabbed it. And it was sitting on the table. And I looked at that Bible and I went. And we began to look for, I began to look for scriptures on mom's situation, on her blood pressure. And Nicole, my phone rings. And, uh, but it's the old cell phone. It's not the smartphone. It was the dumb phone. Okay. And she calls and she says, hey, I found this scripture. And she gave me a scripture over the phone. Well, then my dad, he starts looking, grabbed one of the other Bibles in there. And he starts looking for scripture. And then I found Psalm 57, 7. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. When I read that, I went, yes. Yeah, because it's a heartbeat. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. Your heart is a muscle. Her muscle wasn't producing. And I said, God, that's the scripture. And so I just read the scripture. And do you know what happened? A miracle happened. Dad and I fell asleep. In the waiting area. I mean, I was out. I didn't even wake up. I didn't wake up with. Thoughts of worry, concern, fret. God's got this. And, and, and another miracle happened. Nobody came and got us. She didn't, she didn't flatline. You know? Glory. And so, so here I am in the waiting area, and the doctor comes in, and he, says, and he sets my, my dad and I down, and he said, Mr. Johnson, um, he, said, he said, we're by no means out of the woods, but we did have a good thing happen last night. Well, what happened? He said, initially, when your mom first came in, I took her blood pressure in her foot, and there was no heartbeat. Well, of course, I'm thinking, well, there's hearts up. No, I'm teasing. And she, he knows what he's in. <laughs> he explained to me, he said, whenever, you're, whenever there's a problem like that, everything rushes to help your heart, and so it cuts off the extremities. And that's why he's getting the blood pressure down there. And he said, but here's the, here's the news this morning. Your mom has a strong heartbeat in her foot. And I went, oh. and he left. Dad and I gave each other a high five. We hugged and we were so excited. You say, why are you excited over that? She's still plugged into machines. She still has a ventilator tube down her throat. She's still out. She's unresponsive. 
but she has a strong heartbeat in her foot. And I said, Dad, that's the first manifestation of God's full healing. So for, for whatever reason, you know how they take, you know, they took her clothes off and so they put all of her clothes in the bag. For whatever reason, her gloves didn't make it in the bag. And so a nurse handed me the gloves and she said, you may want to take those home. And I said, no, I want to put those in her bag. And she said, and she argued with me. And I was like, I, I want them in the bag. And she said, why do you want them in the bag? I said, because she's going to wear them home. It's cold outside. Yeah. And the nurse was like, okay. And she puts it, she puts the gloves in the bag. Do you know, so all through that, this was 16 days that she was in the hospital. 16 days. So there were other issues that came up. And the doctor would come and meet with us. And he'd tell us, you know, well... We may be out of the woods on the fact that she has a stronger heart, a little bit stronger. I mean, it wasn't great. It wasn't spectacular. It was, but it was good in that she didn't flatline. And little by little, there was another obstacle. We turned to scripture. And we said, God, you have a promise for this. You have a word for this. And we began to look at scripture. But here, this was key. This was key. <laughs> oh, I had this. i never forget it. My, uh, I, I, it was... Was that on Saturday? Did it happen? So it was on a Saturday. I'm sorry, I should be asking. Well, you wouldn't remember. <laughs> I don't know if you'd remember. But anyway, it was Saturday. And, and so, so it happened on Saturday. So, I, so we had church the next morning. So I, didn't, I hadn't seen my family all day. My, you know, my wife and my kids. And so that Sunday after church, they come in and I see them get off of the elevator and they walk in the hall. And as soon as I see them, I'm overwhelmed. My emotions got the best of me. Many of you know that I'm an easy crier. I mean, I get choked up at a, a Looney Tunes cartoon. I mean, it's, it, I, I, I hate it at times, but I'm thankful that I have a sensitive heart. But anyway, and, and so, so here comes my family, and I'm just overwhelmed, and I just begin to cry profusely. I can't stop. And so I pulled them over to another waiting area and I, until the Holy Spirit could help me get, get my faculties back. And so I'm finally, I'm finally back and so I'm finally not, not crying. And I remember looking at my wife and saying, this is not my faith, these are emotions. Sometimes we confuse the two because feelings don't always fit faith. It's wonderful when they align with faith. Oh, that's, that's a beautiful day. But it's not always a pretty day in the neighborhood, is it? Sometimes there's clouds and storm and wind, and sometimes there's emotions that are trying to get control of you. But you have to make the decision. It doesn't matter what it looks like over here. I choose to believe what God said. We had to come to that place, my dad and I, that we refused to be in fear over mom. That we were, we decided we are going to stand in faith. And what does the Bible say? And having done all to stand, what do you do? And having done all to stand again, what do you do? And another thought, bad thought comes, another bad report comes, what do you do? Yeah, what's the alternative? You lose when you quit. And man, I just, I just remember walking through that and it was situation after situation after situation after situation. But when you put your faith in God, He graces you to walk through what you need to walk through to get to victory. You know how, how, how I take thoughts captive? This happened just not even yesterday. I was having this reoccurring thought that just kept trying to, you know, the, the people, I heard a minister say that um, you have thoughts, you, uh, you know, birds fly over your head, but you don't have to let them make a nest in your hair. I've never seen a bird that wanted to make its nest in my hair. Have you? No. But I wonder if the person that said that ever encountered a starling. Because starlings are relentless. Let me tell you, in, in, our, in our house, 
in our front entryway, when you, when you come in, before you walk in the door, we have a hanging uh, light fixture. And the starlings love to build nests on that light fixture. They love it. And so I was determined this year, not a single starling is going to live on that light this year. So you know what I did? I bought a rubber snake. I put the rubber snake up there. I come out the next day. Two of them are perched on the snake's head. Like looking at me laughing. I can hear them laughing. They were like, yeah, is this the best you got? Plastic snake, you know, rubber snake. And then, then I got an owl. I got a plastic owl. I thought, oh, we're going to get serious now. And I put the owl, they pooped on the owl. Yeah. And I'm just like, my word. I even stood out there with my broom. I left a broom out there so that any time that they tried, I could knock down everything on the light fixture. I even popped one of them. He can, you know how they, they dive you. Okay, I'm sorry, animal activist. Please don't be mad. He, he was okay, all right? Just say no. But Dave was there, didn't you? I mean, I'm baseball bat. I smacked him. And he went flying into the yard, landed on the grass, shook himself off. It said, yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> exactly. And he did. And we were gone, I think, a couple of days. Came back. And there it is, the castle. And now there's baby birds in there. So now I can't do anything. Because everybody, you're always wrong when you mess with babies. Even if they're baby alligators. I mean, you know, you're just... And so... So what I'm saying is, is that thoughts sometimes are relentless like those birds. They keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming. And this is what I found to be effective for me. I, I just want to, to submit this to you. And that's this, that I would, I would get very vulnerable with God. And I would tell him the thought that I'm having. Some people feel like they don't need to, to tell God because he knows everything. But I don't, I don't agree with that. I think you need to. Share it. Because what you're doing is you're divulging to him. You're, you are, you're divulging your heart to him and surrendering to him. And so I, so I did. I, I shared with him. I said, God, I, this thought keeps coming. And this is the thought that I'm having. And you said in your word that, that any temptation... Man, in fact, let's go over there. I think it's Isaiah 55, isn't it? Isaiah 55. Rebecca, you want to come and help me? No, I'm wrong. It's not. No temptation. Say again. First Corinthians ten thirteen. Boy, I was off. I was way off. I was. It, that was. That's another good scripture, though. First Corinthians thirteen. Thank you, John. Everybody say thank you, John. Oh, 10, 13. Okay, 10, verse 13. Oh, man. This is the one right here. This, this, this has been my main scripture to, to if I'm having opportunities with fear, to get free from fear. You got it? Let's read it. In verse 11, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Everybody say, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, so you're not facing anything that you don't have the ability to overcome through Him. Isn't that good news? That means if you're walking through it, you have what you need inside of you to walk through it. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you get through what you're going through, right? So He says, God is able beyond that which you were able, But with that temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I shared with God the thought I was having. And I said, Lord, you said that I wouldn't be tempted beyond that which I'm able, but you would give me a way of escape. I'm asking you of a way of escape. Well, guess what happened? Thought gone. I just began to worship him and thank him. But the thought was gone because... The seed for fear is what happens in your thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If 
you have a fear of riding motorcycles or being on a motorcycle, don't get on one. Because you can only ride a motorcycle in faith. Oh, oh, there's so much to this that <clears throat> it's difficult to... I, I, my mind is like racing all these different directions. But I, I want to I encourage you. When, when that happened with mom, we began to believe God. And we didn't believe God for partial... Oh God, just, you know, even if, even if you could just fix this one thing, we could live with that. We serve the God that does exceedingly abundantly and above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. So that means I have the responsibility to believe God. I have the responsibility to stand in faith. And one of the things that we determined with mom was that it would be a whole recovery, whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole recovery, not partial, not paralysis, because, you know, I remember when mom came to and she was having difficulty, uh, she, she woke up, she had the ventilator tube still in, and so we were trying to communicate, and I said, well, here, I'll get you a pen, and you can write it down, and her hands were not to where they were operational yet, you know, and I remembered, okay, we're, we're believing, Ma, we're believing, continue to believe for her hands that that will, that will reconnect. And guess what? She signs her own checks because God did a whole recovery. See, Jesus said it's according to your faith. Do we really believe that, or are we going to settle to just get what we can? out of it. I, God loves us too much. He loves us too much to not, to not give you everything that you believe for. So I, I want to pray for you this morning. I, I don't know who that was for. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing to sit on the front row and God completely change everything that you were going to say in a moment. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God. But I, I love him. And the, the, the reason is, is because it's for somebody specific in here. There's something going on in this room that needed to be dealt with. And so if you would bow your heads all around the room, I want to pray for you. I don't want to point you out. I don't, I don't want to make you, you feel bad. But how many of you would say, without anybody looking around, I don't need people counting hands or checking to see whether or not someone's raising their hand. I'm only asking you to raise your hand for God's sake. It's an act of faith. Do you say, that's me. I've been dealing repetitively with fear. It's something I want to overcome in my life. If that's you, raise your hand all around the room. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, just a bunch of people. Okay. <clears throat> we preached last week on first love. Scripture says that perfect love or perfected love casts out fear. When I realized that it was my fear that brought this situation in my life, I determined to not allow myself to ever fear again. You can only do that by stepping into love. That's an important piece to this. So I, I want to pray for you. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just love you so much. God, thank you that you've not given us the spirit of fear. Lord, that whenever fear arises, we recognize where it comes from, that it did not come from you, that it came from the enemy. And Father, we refuse to give it any right, any place in our life. And so Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. Lord, that you... You are causing us to rise up, to walk in love and in peace because perfect love casts out fear. I thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing. I come against fear in Jesus' name. And I declare freedom over every person in here now. Freedom. Free from fear. Will we step into love? 
we step out of fear. Thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. No more fear.